Hello everyone, welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music, be that rock, punk, metal or extreme metal. I got a new chair, I thought it was going to be less squeaky, it completely is not. Coming up on this week's show, we've got new music from Linus, which is a new band featuring former members of Gallows and the Ghost Riders in the Sky. We've got new music from Kill Switch Engage, as well as Nervous, as well as some album news for Nervous and their upcoming third album? I probably should have written that down. I forgot. Uh, album reviews then come from Jamie Lenman, Truly Leone's Rhapsody, and it's I just I really struggle with that name. And Royal Republic with the out al- album mic, open mic I should say, going to Hawkeyes and their simultaneously third, second, and first album ideas that came out in 2012. Again, th- there's a lot of mess. There's just a lot of mess this week, but we will we will get there as and when. So, we will start with the new music for this week. And we shall start with Lioness. Lioness is the new band featuring Steph Carter from Gallows and the Ghost Rise in the Sky and his wife Gillian, who is also in Ghost Rise in the Sky. And I believe one more alumni from Ghost Riders as well. Um, They've got a new sound called I Don't Care. They have been doing the rounds live quite recently. And they did a show with Gold Key, again, also featuring members of uh, Gallows, among other notable names. Uh, The Watford, like, punk and alt-rock scene are very, very, like, tight-knit. So it's you don't have to go very far to find someone else who's been in the band with that other person who's been in the band with that other person, etc, etc, etc. It's kind of like Leeds, which I'll kind of get to with Hawkeye a little bit. Uh, the song is called I Don't Care. It is really big, riffy alt-rock. I've been quite intrigued for music to come from Lioness because uh, the little videos that get posted online via like Instagram and Instagram Live, it is, it's got a lot of the same melody from Ghost Riders, but a lot punch and a lot bigger sounding riffs which is exactly what this is um, i'm intrigued i'll be in- interested to find out if a well if and when an ep or an album comes out following on from this uh, it's fan if you are a fan of elbow feeder or i am giant i know that the bands i thought closely related to this i think it'd be what i think it might be worth your time to go check it out it's called i don't care and the band are called lioness it's pronounced it's pronounced it's spelt even L Y O N E S S. Because Edge. Uh, the other new song we got from this week, I've literally only just heard, it's from Kill Switch Engage. The song is called I Am Broken 2, and it is their second single? Yeah, second. Second single from their new album coming out the 16th of August called Atonement. Um, it's called I Am Broken 2. It is the most, I was trying to think of like a comparison, but it's very much easily the most melodic song I've heard Killswitch do in a very long time. Um, I was trying to compare it for like um, you know like that bass level, and the closest thing I can think of is take the really melodic choruses from say "Willing" by Times of Grace or "My Last Serenade," but "Serenade," yeah, sure, "My Last Serenade" from like early kill switch take the choruses of them and imagine them just stretched out for a whole like three four minute song it's kind of what you get um i'm in i'm interested it's a lot it's different from what kill switch have done like i will i'm not gonna sit here and pretend to be the biggest kill switch fan in the world it's not because i don't think they're very good it's just because they're a band i've never really got in on that much um but i think I like I like Jesse as a vocalist, so as what we think it's what's making it sound really promising for me. Um, I can't remember too much about the other song. I don't think I've heard it yet, but you know, if I'm always about always a fan of adding more melody into metalcore. Uh, the third asking Alexand- asking Alexandria record had that for me, like where they went from quite generic metalcore to add a little bit more melody and then with um from death to death from death to destiny really went ham on the melody and it made it such a fucking good record and you know it might be what happens with kill switch you never know the album comes out um fuck it out less than a month away are we all excited um there's also new music and new album information 
coming from Nervous. It is the other side to M. Foster, the other side being the other other side being Milk Teeth. And the fact that she has just 101 different bands going on. She's a mad, mad lady. Uh, Nervous have a new album coming out called Tough Crowd. It's coming out the 27th of September. It will be their third album following on from Everything Dies. Uh, I really enjoyed Everything Dies. It was. It took me a while to get into because it's not a style of music I'll always go for. It is very... It's very cynical, don't get me wrong, but it's very light heart. It's the ultra light hearted side of like an emo y indie pop rock kind of thing. Um, with the new song Flies, it's still familiar in the fact that it's quite that like the pop sided indie rock with a bit of edge. But I think on this time, the pop punk elements, especially the punk elements, I don't know if it's. Um, the riffing, the vocal execution of what it is, but I think like the punk has been turned up quite a bit. The chorus is catchy as hell. I'm way into it. This new song is called Flies, and yeah, it's part of the new album called Tough Crowd. It's coming out in just over two months. Yes, I can math. Yeah, just over two months. It's called Tough Crowd. It's by Nervous. Do go check it out. The new song, new single, lead single, whatever. It's called Flies, and yeah, I really think it's very, very good. Top job, lads. Okay, then, on to album reviews, then. We're going to start with Surrey's favourite son. I don't know if they have another son, but it is Jamie Lenman and his third solo album called Shuffle. Um, it's hard to pinpoint what kind of music Jamie Lenman does because in my humblest of opinions... He is the UK's answer to Devin Townsend in the way that, you know, Devin is a man who is not restricted to one genre. Um, he will, over the course of his discography, including Strapping Young Lad, he will, you know, he's like, don't get me wrong, Devin Townsend is very much, he's known for his prog, but he'll blend that prog with pop rock, um, new wave, symphonic, uh, death metal, black metal. He's done grindcore before. He's played on a hardcore punk record. What else has he done? Uh, he's done a dark country album. He's done a. He's part of a neoclassical album. He's done an outright parody punk rock album. He does a little bit of everything. And so, Jamie Lenman is kind of like our interpretation of that because Jamie. Throughout his career, especially with Ruben, and since coming back as a solo artist, God damn it, chair, um, he is of that similar ilk where he is not restricting himself just to one genre. I remember in an interview he did with, I think it was That's Not Metal podcast, He, the reason why Devolver, his second album, was like so split in terms of genre is because he generally feels people aren't restricted down to just one genre. And that is true, but not as optimistically as I think he wants to believe. Does that make sense? People are narrow-minded is what I'm trying to say because I don't like people. Um, and he comes from like... You look at that background that he has with Room, with Muscle Memory, which was a two-half album, one half of very calm and coordinated folk rock and the other being very intense cathartic hardcore and then you go into um devolver which has got loads of different things going on he is a man of many genres and he is yeah he just wants to he just wants to have fun regardless of what labels are or that kind of thing um the new album then shuffle it is a covers album that covers that's a weird sentence um TV themes, movies, The Beatles, Cindy, Cindy Lauper, uh, Moby Dick. Uh, I think there's a X. No, oh, there is an X Men cartoon cover in there as well. Or oh, there was the game. There was an X Men video game cover as well. It is a mad, mad collection of songs that a he's covering and b the styles he's putting into play. 
and I always feel like it's a difficult trick with covers album or even cover songs because with music fans being as fickle as they are renowned to be, especially, I'm sad to say, the stereotyped alternative music fan, um, you need to be able, with a cover song, you need to be able to leave enough of the original behind to cater to the nostalgists who, you know, love the original and don't want anyone to go near it, but are kind of intrigued what you're going to do with it anyways. But you need to put enough of a spin on it that you are claiming it as your own. And it's not just reading the tabs of another song and singing over it. It is, you are putting your own personality into it. Like, my comparison is you take Mr. Blue Sky by Weezer from early in the year, which is just a carbon copy of the original, and then you look at any of the covers that Disturbed have done, you know, like um, Land of Confusion or Sound of Silence. Guaranteed there's going to be a generation of people who still don't know that Sound of Silence is not a Disturbed song. It took me a good few years to realise that Land of Confusion wasn't a Disturbed song. Because they're just... They took a song and put so much of their own selves into it. They did indeed make it themselves. Their own, sorry. Um, but at the same time as all of that, originality doesn't always mean a good cover. There is a band, like OG wrestling fans may remember, a band called H-Blocks. They did a few songs with, I think it was for Triple H. I think he did the, they did the DX song. No, DX song was something, um, something Warren. I think he did the, the old Triple H music. Um, H-Blocks released a cover of Ring of Fire, obviously by Johnny Cash. And they had some uh, reggae rapper in it as well. And Jesus fucking wept. It was awful. It was so bad. It And they did everything they needed to do. Because it's a popular song, trying to make it like appeal to nostalgia, that was easy because it's such a huge song. They put their own spin in it as a new metal post-grunge band with this fucking reggae singer on, on for the ride. And it was just bad. It was, it was very ungood. So... I guess the the short version of all that is cover songs and cover album, albums are very, very difficult. Um, and for better or for worse, like I said before, Lenman has never been one to like sort of restrict himself to one genre. So he does kind of have a lot of wiggle room for what a cover should and can sound like. Um, because it's not got to be a thing of you're not stick enough to original or you're not sticking enough to what your core sound is and blah blah because Jamie doesn't really have a core sound. Uh the album um blah, 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 blah. good. The album opens with Tomorrow Never Knows, which is a Beatles cover somewhere. And it slowly builds layer by layer by layer and takes out a lot of the avant gardeness from the original Beatles song from Revolver. And there is Again, taking out that avant-garde makes it an original song to Jamie, but whilst at the same time, because it is a Beatles song and like pretty much every Beatles song is iconic, there's still enough there for the hardcore Beatles fans to say, that's a Beatles song, I'm digging it. It's like that song that I know, but modern and different. Um, and from there it gets a little bit odd, because after... Tomorrow Never Knows, it then goes into um, a hardcore version. Sorry, no, there's a, a little bit further down the line, I should say. You eventually get to a cover of Pop Art of Sailor Man, which is a brand of hardcore straight from like the hardcore side of muscle memory. And it is at this point where you have to start questioning... Is it lunacy or is it genius on display from Mr. Lenman? Do we need to give him a prize or do we need to give him a rubber room? Because it's a fucking hardcore cover of Popeye the Sailor Man. What do you do with that? Uh, the song itself, as batshit as it is, is fucking great. 
Um, Lemon is a man, like I said before, he doesn't... He does believe, sorry, people are naturally broad with their musical tastes. Um, which is why he has such a lack of commitment to any one single style of music. Uh, he's always known for exploring the boundaries and pushing the envelope in terms of what's deemed normal. And Shuffle then goes into that and then some. You've got Song of Cyclos. Cyclos. It's a Greek word. I'm not too great with Greek. Um, Song of Cyclos we'll go with. Uh, it's an interpretation of the... Fuck, why did I write it down again? The Cyclos Epitaph, which, after doing a little bit of a Google, it is one of the oldest surviving, fully rendered musical compositions on the planet. Which, that on its own is pretty fucking fascinating to go and, like, discover and that kind of thing. I know on the liner notes of the album, he talks about the um, these songs on the album... Are some of my favourite. I listen to them all the time. I've been wanting to do some of these things since I was a lad. I don't know. That, it says a lot about the man if his one of his favourite songs of all time is a carving on an ancient Greek... I think it's Greek. Ancient Greek um, epitaph that's like thousands of years old. He is a, he is a weird dude, but a fun weird dude. He's, he's a He's a kind of dude you want to hang out with a lot. I don't know what that means, but we're going to stick with it. Keep punching the fucking pop shield. Um, from Song of Cyclos, it goes into the Pequod. I've never seen that word before. Uh, the Pequod meets the Delight, which is a one-man reading of a chapter from Moby Dick. Because why not? And then Taxi Driver is literally a cover of the main theme from the film of the same name. He is exploring and he's experimenting with things that fascinate him and that appeal to him, which is, it's almost semi-autobiographical in that nature. And it just exudes the theme from, or well, of Shuffle. You know, it's just a, a random assortment of something. Like, you imagine you put your Spotify, your iTunes on the full Shuffle, your entire library on the Shuffle, and you, you, well, you would get like the maddest collection of, excuse me, the maddest collection of music. For the actual quote unquote songs, though, uh, Lenman easily remains. I know these are song, uh, these are covers, so therefore he's probably got a lot of bass already there to work from. But his adaptions and what he can do with music and how he can still take a known song and make it unique in his own solidifies Lenman as one of the best songwriters this country has right now um his adaptions for songs like love song for a vampire and a handsome stranger called death are just incredible um love song for a vampire matches annie lennox's like reverby drama just perfectly it sounds so i haven't got another word for it but it just sounds so dramatic and so um just Soap opera, I guess. I'm trying to avoid saying drama for like the third time in a sentence. And turning a handsome stranger into a brass backed acoustic jam just makes it one of the chilliest yet catchiest tracks in Lenman's entire back catalogue. It's fucking great. And that's going up against the acoustic side of Muscle Memory, which I really, really, really like. Um, and then you get to eventually get to She Bop, which is a cover of Cindy Lauper, and that actually might go down as one of the best songs of the entire fucking year. I cannot stop listening to that song. I think I played it five times in a row the other day because it's just a. F oh, God, it's good. Um, it's a style of project, Shuffle, that I would love to see more artists and more acts do. Just literally hit Shuffle, grab a couple of songs, and just go to town. Like, we don't need another cover of Rocket Man. We don't need another cover of um, Sweet Child of Mine or Master of Puppets or anything like that. Go for, like, the really niche things where you go for your shuffling like, man, that's a corker of a song. Let's have a go at that. Oh, I would, if I had, like, a shred of musical talent, I'll be doing it now, but I am music creatively retarded. The album is absolutely bonkers. It's a 
bonkers piece of music. Um, but what it differs from, say, the Teal album is that as much fun as I feel like Jamie's having and as much fun as, or as much as he's like put a lot of himself into the album, he also wants to challenge himself and he wants to challenge the listener. Um, he wants to give everyone, like, it's not going to be an easy ride going through. He wants people not to struggle with an album, that's not quite right, but just to really take everything in. He, I honestly believe if he, if you just, if I just sat and went, yeah, it's really easy listening from to back, it's fine. I think he would find that as a bit disappointing. He was like, well, I did all these like weird and wonderful things. Did you not like notice this part? Did you not notice that part? You know, that I've never met the man, but that's kind of like the vibe I get from him from interviews and listening to what he's like creatively. Um, and he, yeah, he just wants to be different from what is seen as the norm. In terms of trying to, like, if you're a fan of this, because there's so much going on, it's difficult. Like, the only thing I can think of is if you are a fan of Lemon's previous work, if you were ever a fan of Ruben, go check it out. But then I feel like if you are a fan of either of those things, you will already be looking at Shuffle. Um, I honestly think there is something in here for pretty much anyone who goes near it. The album is called Shuffle. It is the third solo album from the former Ruben frontman, Jamie Lenman. And it is just, like I said, it's a maddening collection of music. But my God, is it fun. Right then, on to an album I've been quietly excited about for. Um, it is Zero Gravity, Rebirth and Evolution. It's the debut album from the new... It's not quite a band. It's not quite a super group. There's a little explaining. We'll get to it. Band that is Trilli Leone Rhapsody. I really hope I pronounce those names right. That's the way I've been pronouncing those names for years. No one's ever corrected me. But here we are. Um, like I said, it's the debut from debut album from the band. They are from Trieste in Italy. And they play... Well, anyone who knows anything about Rhapsody will know they are the leading band for symphonic power metal. Anyway. Literally anywhere. They are, they are the go-to. They are fucking brilliant at it. And... I've written down a base of the story that is Rhapsody of Fire and how we're at a band called Terrelli Leone Rhapsody that isn't quite Rhapsody of Fire but kind of still is. Um, so here we go. Excuse me, need to get the death out of my system. The spine of Rhapsody of Fire for many, many years was Luca Terrelli, the uh, lead guitarist. Fabio Leone, lead singer, Alex Staropoli, the keyboardist, and Alex Holdsworth, the drummer. You had a few bassists and guitarists in the middle for a bulk of that time, like especially the core period in the 2000s where they were like hot shit. You had uh, Dominique Lurkin, who was a session musician, he used to go live with them everywhere, but I don't think contributed much to the music in the studio and you had bassist um patrice gears who again was with the band for loads loads of years i think he joined like after album three or four whereas the other four to really feel um truly leone star poli and holsworth were there since pretty much the inception or like the early demos so shout out to gears and lurkin they have they have been like great for the band but for me and my interpretation of the band the core has been to really leone star Poli, and holsworth like if i've got that wrong do let me know um everything was fine and dandy for a number of years with um th like with that six um i remember simply in shantlands 2 was the first album from maps i heard of and it was just great twilight and agony was just like a darker thing altogether. I really, really enjoyed it when I was growing up. And then in 2011, Turili left the band and he took Gears and Lurkin with him and he formed Luca Turili's Rhapsody. Apparently, everything was very amicable. But from 2011 onwards, you had two different iterations of Rhapsody of Fire. You had Rhapsody of Fire, the core band, and you had Luca Turili's Rhapsody. Okay, this is where the timeline splits. Now we've got two Rhapsodies. 
And this would continue for five years until 2016, when Leone and Holsworth both left Rhapsody. And they would go off and do a variety of things between them. I know Leone... Excuse me. Leone uh, went back to front in anger. I think he did a few live bits. I feel like he did... Camelot? But I'm not... I don't... I'll question that. Um, but yeah, either way, Leone and Holsworth did various different things. And then eventually, within that year, they rejoined Trilly, Gewers, and Lurkin to form what is now... Well, they did like a reu some reunion shows live, but then eventually it would become Trilly, Leone, Rhapsody, which is what we have now. So, for a very short time, we had three Rhapsodies. We had the actual Rhapsody of Fire that had a, pretty much a complete new lineup bar Alex Staropoli, who was still with the band. You had Luca Trilly's Rhapsody, which a fun thing I found out whilst doing all this was the lead singer from Luca Turilli's Rhapsody, um, Alessandro Conti, did a collaborative album very recently, I think 2017, did a collaborative album with uh, Fabio Leone called Conti Leone. And yeah, it's just, it's weird how this is all crossing over. But anyways, three Rhapsodies, the core one, Rhapsody of Fire, Luca Turilli's Rhapsody, and then you had um, Turilli Leone Rhapsody. Uh, Luca Turilli's Rhapsody would fold in December 2018. So that left just a two again. You've got Rhapsody of Fire with um, Staropoli, and you've got this kind of secondary, but has the entire lineup from Rhapsody of Fire's best period version of Rhapsody. Turilli Leone Rhapsody. And yeah, I fuck, reading that out loud, I'm confused. I've got a headache. I want to go home. Oh, God. Why is this so difficult, lads? It's weird because at no point do I feel like there is anger or resentment anywhere. Because if there was, Truly and Leone wouldn't work together. Truly wouldn't have taken Lurkid and Gewers to form the new band. Holsworth and Leone wouldn't have joined all three of them. Staropoli would hasn't been trying to sue them as far as I'm aware as a breach of name. Everyone's very, very happy with what the other person's doing, but they just don't want to do it together. Completely. I, pff, Italians, man. Um, I I spoke about a lot in the podcast, especially last week when I was talking about the Manowar album. I, like, all my feelings about power metal, they go up by about an inflation of about a thousand when there's an orchestral element into it. It's like going to a house party in a three-piece suit you are it is going to be a mad just stupid time that you're going to love but because of the orchestral like part of it you classy it is straight away it's quite an interesting i guess 2019 take on a for lack of a better word, classic Rhapsody of Fire liner, which, you know, as much as they want to brand themselves the Torelli Leone iteration, they are effectively, they are all members of Rhapsody together at one point. It's, yeah, don't. Um, it's an interesting take because Rhapsody are known for, sorry, Rhapsody of Fire are known for their fancy lyrics. So it's very Wizards, it's very D&D. &D, um, Whereas Zero Gravity takes on a more sci-fi guise. It is, there's a lot more electronic-y little bits in there. Um, there are, like, you've got the overall wall of sound, which is very symphonic and very powerful, and etc. But there's just, like, the little tinkering here and there. Little, um, like, surges that you hear in the background. And it's it's an incorporation of a lot of what Trilli was doing with the his his version of Rhapsody that existed between 2011 and 2018. Because one of the big things he did or wanted to do when he left OG Rhapsody was he wanted to have a more cinematic feel to the music compared to what he already had, which is maddening. It's, well, he's a man, it's 2019, he still has a mullet and pulls it off well, so he is... An enigma. 
Um, musically though, even with like the little glitchy stuff and the little electronic bits here and there, this is fucking great. Um, it feels and sounds like an organic orchestra that's playing. And it's, I know on albums they have had a full orchestra with this one because it was crowdfunded. I don't, I, they, well, I, so I was about to say, I don't think they will. They did not. They absolutely did not. And it was recorded in San Marino. I don't think San Marino can fit an orchestra. Um, the keyboards were handled by Turilli. He organized them all. He has worked on the keyboards before. I think it was, I think it was his Dream Quest project where he was, his role in the band was as a keyboardist. Uh, in between him playing the keyboards, the production was handled by Tarelli and Leone, and it was mixed by Simone Mulrani. M no, M Mulrani. Mulroney, excuse me. Who has worked with loads of bands, and a l about 70% of them have some kind of symphonic part of their sound. So. He has worked a lot in that field, so he knows how to get the best out of a symphonic orchestral kind of noise. And so between the three of them, they have conjured up such a brilliant, again, organic orchestral sound. And yeah, so truly on his own, his guitar playing still intrigues me. I remember really going ham on him and listening to Rhapsody in like 2008 and just trying to like mentally keep up with his guitar playing and like watching videos upon videos upon videos of him and just looking at it like how like why do not why do why don't i should say more people know about rhapsody or luca Turilli or you know just this whole field of music back when i was young and naive and not in a squeaky chair um, but just like the the riffs he can mu uh, he can muster the solos, the tone of his guitar, just the general neoclassical style of play, it's really is just incredible. He's such a joy to watch in videos and live and that kind of thing. Uh, Leone is still an absolute king as a vocalist. I think even when Rhapsody were at their weakest, which uh, God, I can't remember what the album's called. The one that came... I think one of the first albums that came out after... Um, truly left OG Rhapsody. I can't even remember what it's called. Not Tribe of Agony. The, oh, that was it. From Chaos to Eternity. I remember listening to that and just... Being kind of unimpressed, same with Dark Wings of Steel. I don't know if that's because there was an internal thing or they just like they just had a bad record or a couple of bad records on the trot. And even when I was listening to them and thinking, ah, it's just it's not quite the same anymore. Leone still sounded just impeccable. He is he's like up there with Eric Adams, he is still one of my favourite vocalists just ever. He he can put in a top tier performance when the rest of the band around him is just playing on Hello Kitty instruments and it'll still sound at least a good six or seven out of ten because of him. Um so between the core musical components of or like the lead musical components of of the band and the band like the sound that's made them so popular over the years the drama they can conjure up together on songs like Decoding the Multiverse, um, Zero Gravity, Multidimensional, and just et al. It's almost, it feels like it should be patented for Trilli and Leone, just being able to conjure up that kind of drama in music. Um, I really enjoy the trade-off between Leone and Elise Rid, or Elise Ride, not quite sure how to pronounce her last name. Uh, she is the female vocalist from Amaranth, and they collaborate in a song called DNA, uh, Demon and Angel, which, aside from the Do You Get It name, which does irk me a little bit, um, I think they bounce off each other really, really well. Elise is in the right kind of range vocally 
to she can benefit from bouncing off of Leonie and she can also help Leonie sound even better than what he already does. I think they've done really well to find someone in that like vocal range and vocal talent. She just keeps up so well. And I like initially I was like, ah, not playing it off because I wasn't interested, but just I got hooked on the lead single Zero Gravity quite quickly. And so DNA was just in the way of the song I really wanted to hear. The more I listened to DNA, I was like, actually, Elise is really, really good on this. Um, And I hope this means there's more collaborations because there's two on here. Um, Like in the past, Rhapsody of Fire, as far as I'm aware, have only really worked with Christopher Lee for, well, they've worked together for a lot of their collaborations, a lot of their albums in the Emerald Soul Saga that was the bulk of the 2000s. Um, you've got Ali's on DNA. You've also got I Am with Mark Basil. Mark Basil from DJM. DJ, fucking letters, come on. DGM, sorry, man. Um, initially, I was l- more of a weak song for me, I Am, but it's really grown on me the last couple of days. Listen to it towards like the end of the week for before reviewing it. And yeah, I'll be totally up to seeing or hearing, sorry, more collaboration between either interpretations of Rhapsody, to be honest, and outside vocalists, um, especially if they can get the right kind of ranges. Because uh, Mark does the same thing. He uses that right kind of range that can sit alongside Leone quite well. I could even see them, especially with uh, Leon and Conti doing the album that I was talking about a minute ago, uh, earlier from Luca Torelli's Rhapsody, getting Conti on a song for the next album just to have that parallel again. I don't know. There are there are still a few, a few niggles that exist on the album that go just beyond like the cheesiness that comes with power metal. Um, I love the song Zero Gravity, as I said before. But that like Middle Eastern-y kind of break halfway through, it just felt kind of out of place. I don't really know why it was there. It just didn't really feel like it sat quite right. Um, it does lead into a fucking great solo though, so, you know. Swings and roundabouts. Um, the, the biggest niggle for me is um, on... Amata Immortale, which is a slow, very intimate, very folksy kind of song. I really don't like the resting vocal, which goes against pretty much everything I've just said about Leone. But when it calls for a more powerful, higher note, it's fine. It's Leone being Leone, Leone good at what he does but that bass vocal especially like the vocal when like uh, the opening sorry when it all starts coming in it just sounded like a really shit phone sex service just like really close to the mic being mm, yes i'm gonna put on the mildly deep tone and bit of a bit of a husk and it's just rhapsody of fire have a song called gardens of destiny which they recorded in english and italian um I know the English version pops up on the Dark Secret EP. I feel like the Italian version, Guardians del Destino, appears somewhere else. But I might be wrong. But either way, on that, it is a symphonic, folky, folksy kind of song, similar vein to Amata Immortale. And Leone in that has a very... Compared to what you can usually do with like big notes, he's very subdued, very slowed down, very tender kind of vocal line. And he does it perfectly on there. Gardens of Destiny is one of my favourite um, Rhapsody of Fire songs ever. And it just, it doesn't, he if when he's capable of that, I don't know why he hasn't done something similar on this. And I don't know why he hasn't grabbed me in the same way as the previous one, but... Yeah, the vocal on Amate Motale just did not do it for me. I did not like that rest vocal, that like the calm vocal, I guess. 
whatever you want to call it, it's just, yeah. Not one for me, I'm afraid. And like I said, it goes against everything I've ever said about Leone, which is awkward. And the final little point I made, it's not so much as a, it's wrong or I don't like it. It's just finding out that the last song in the album, which is a bonus track called Oceano, to find out that's a Josh Groban cover was a really fun surprise. I was... N- There's many things I expect, like, especially after Jamie Lenman's album, like, covers can come from pretty much anywhere. Still was not quite expecting a cover from Josh Groban. But here we are, it's 2019, we can do what we want now. If you've ever listened to a any interpretation of Rhapsody, even going as far back as the Thundercross days, which is OG to fuck, I don't understand why he won't go in for Tarelli Leone in Rhapsody. It's the same universe, if they're going to talk about multiverse, it's the same sort of thing. And at the moment, I was thinking hard about this. As it stands at the moment, I think the actual Rhapsody of Fire album that came out this year, The Eighth Mountain, is slightly winning it over for me compared to Zero Gravity. I like... The musicianship from Zero Gravity, but I prefer the songwriting from The Eighth Mountain. I think that's what's swaying it. Um, also, with Eighth Mountain, The Eighth Mountain I've had for a few months now. Zero Gravity has been a week or so. So it might change by the end of the year, but that's where it's sitting at the moment. I will keep everyone updated with the Rhapsody of Fire comparison throughout the year. Don't worry, lads. Um, but yeah, any iteration of Rhapsody of Fire, definitely going for this. If you're a fan of Avantasia as well, or Camelot, the very bombastic, very, again, symphonic power metal kind of thing, I do think you should go for this one as well. It is Truly Leone. It is the first album from the new Rhapsody of Fire spin-off. And hopefully, I, I'm banking on the fact that they are going to continue along this guys for many an album. And I am all about it it should be a cracking good time um sorry getting death out lurili lurili why didn't just be called themselves lurili to really leone rhapsody zero gravity rebirth and evolution tis out new and yeah jolly good fun if you like cheesy power metal like me all right then on to the third album of the week and by far as much as i love everything else that's happened this week the funnest album of the week. It is album number four from Malmo Natives, Royal Republic. The album is called Club Majesty. Royal Republic were previously known for playing a very upbeat, hivesy style garage rock. But as we get further into this, you will know they have adapted, we'll say. They've evolved. They've done something weird. But yeah, they came through as like big garage rock hitters and i've always thought like garage rock is quite a party rock kind of genre it's the sort of thing where you can always get like a bouncing leg or like a good head bop or just having fun to the music i can't recall a song off some head now where i'm listening to garage rock and i'm sad or i'm listening to garage rock and the song is sad um songs like tommy gun and underwear they are lyrically simple, lyrically quite daft, but overall are a really fun time. And I think a big part of what made, what got Royal Republic a lot of attention to begin with, with that debut album, um, The Royal, is it was released on Roadrunner Records, which I know Roadrunner are very expansive of what they release nowadays, but still, whenever you get something that isn't metal, it's still seen as quite like a different kind of thing. So from there, they went on to Save the Nation, which t- still now I think is bloody brilliant. Um, songs like Everyone Wants to Be an Astronaut, Sailing Man, just the catchiest songs you could ever imagine. And then if my memory recalls, sometime after save the nation royal republic went into 
it wasn't quite a hiatus, but it was a break because they needed to deal with some personal demons, which, you know, it's, if you've got, cause that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. During that time where I was, I completely switched off paying attention, they managed to release Weekend Man in 2016, and they formed an acoustic side project called Royal Republic and the Nosebreakers, released an album as Royal Republic and the Nosebreakers, which is basically an acoustic greatest hits of all their previous re- uh, previous records. So I somehow managed to miss all of that, all the fucking that, and it, I think it's by chance I happened to see um, Club Majesty just in the ether, and they are now on Nuclear Bass Records with one of the most un-Nuclear Bass albums I've heard in just a very long time i think it's not quite to the level of earache signing ali reza but you know it's not far off and um, they've evolved their garage rock what did i what did i say garage how oh, garish they evolved their garage rock sound there we go to feature like dance rock you've got new wave in there you've got glam you've got disco because obviously it is just bathed in this 80s hue which just it's god it's so much fun it's such a fun album like holy fucking shit i genuinely smiled listening to this i never smile i hate smiling but jesus fuck dude it's so different to Nuclear Blast's usual forte. And it is a huge, huge step in Royal Republic sound. Uh, the opening song, Fireman and Dancer, starts with this really fun, hypnotic, funk rock riff. Um, I've tried to like... You know when you're listening to music, um, and if you've had any kind of like musical lessons or training or whatever before... In your head, you're trying to like imagine where everyone's fingers are going or where everyone's arms are moving or feet or whatever. I was trying to do that for the, the opening riff of Fireman and Dancer, and I just can't do it. His fingers move, but his plucking is too fast and too almost random, but it all makes sense because obviously it does. It's mad. Um, so you've got all that going off, and then it just explodes with this massive Steven Tyler-esque wail from Adam Grant. The chorus is like layer built vocal harmony. Like imagine a barbershop quartet that's come straight out of the Vegas Strip. And then just for good measure, they bust out a saxophone solo. Just for good measure. Just why not? Why fucking 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 why not? Hey, why not? The follow up to that is Can't Fight the Disco, which has God's greatest instrument. The Cowbell, which immediately makes it one of the songs of the record. And there's more songs I'll go into in more detail in a bit, but just the album, it's designed for fun. Like, it's no sad um, ballad on here. There's no feelings song. There's no big sweeping fringe. It is putting on ridiculous sequins, shiny boots, and just having a jolly good time out on the town getting quite inebriated and that's okay that's all fine that's what you that some for some people that's what you want to do i personally before prefer my kingdom of solitude but we're different people the as much as the album is fun royal republic the reason why it is so much fun i think um, is they they just refuse to hide the humour. They've got such a great sense of humour and it is just everywhere on this album. Fortune Favours, which I've gone on about Shebop with Jamie Lenman. Fortune Favours will also be one of my favourite songs of the year if I ever get round to chronicling them. It is a masterclass in confrontational disco, which apparently now is a thing. I would love everyone to start doing a confrontational disco song um anna lee sounds like an homage to 
the Human League and just 80s synth pop and new wave in general. And the closing song, Bulldog, is apparently literally a song about a dog. Because we sing about girls, we sing about drugs, we sing about love, we sing about sex, we sing about boys. Why can't we start singing about dogs? That's what I'm saying. Musically, I think the song closely resembles the OG Royal Republic sound is Stop Moving. And even that is a... It kind of feels looping because it's just pretty much the same lyrics over and 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 over again. But it's still got a lot of like little electro-funk moments scattered here, there and everywhere. It is ludicrous ambition is this album but it's executed to the highest standard um as every song passes the next song sees it as a challenge to beat it in beat and bounce just general good timedness there's no song or there's no real moment that i can think of that i can really fault you know there's some songs i prefer over others like i thought Stop moving is a bit too repetitive, but that's about it. I can see Club Majesty going the same way as Technology by Don Broco last year, where in any other situation, it would be a guilty pleasure. But because it's so damn good, there's no need in feeling guilty about liking it because it. it the quality is just so high and i think just club majesty is fucking brilliant i absolutely see it in my top 20 at the end of the year um yeah if you like for comparison's sake i've thought of beat stakes franz ferdinand and electric six but if you just want upbeat music Regardless of what you listen to, like if you listen to a Monomath or Justin Bieber or Watain or Lil Mix, go for this still because it's just the, the goodest of times. It is the fourth album from Swedish band Royal Republic. It is called Club Majesty. It is a, again, like a lot of the albums here have been a mad hodgepodge of sounds and flavors and Imagine just getting a scoop of every ice cream from a Ben and Jerry's tub and just mixing it all together, and that's where Club Majesty is. You're gonna have a great time. It's gonna be full of everything, and you just you just don't give a shit because you're having a good time and you're drunk, and who cares? Still a little bit dying inside. Cool. So those were your three albums of this week. We're gonna move on now to open mic, and I need to sort out names of that, don't I? Um, so yeah, we're going to move on to the other Mike album. It comes from 2012. It is, the, well, the album is called Ideas. The band is called Hawkeyes. And as I said at the top of the show, you can see Ideas as being the third, the second, and the first album from the lead based alternative metal, but there's so much more going on. We'll get to it. Band. And that's because... We'll talk about it a bit more, but they were originally called um, Chicken Hawk, and they released a self-titled album as Chicken Hawk, and they then released a follow-up called Modern Bodies, and then after Modern Bodies came Ideas, so that's what makes it album number three. But during the cycle for Modern Bodies, they went from Chicken Hawk to Hawkeyes, so that eliminates the self-titled um chicken hawk album and modern bodies so that makes it the first that makes ideas the hawkeye's first album technically but then in amongst all this when they changed the name they re-released modern bodies modern bodies sorry as like under the name hawkeye's so there's versions of the album that are by chicken hawk and there's versions of the album that are by hawkeye's but it's still the same album so what makes it the second album in hawkeye's uh, discography it's really confusing why must everyone be confusing now just just fuck um 
Hawkeyes were are another band that was in that Metal Hammer era of discovering music. Um, and when I spoke earlier about the likes of Jamie Lenman and Devin Townsend being men of many genres, nowadays it's something that's a bit more accepted. I'm not sure that's the right word, but it's more... It just happens more. Like, you look at Conjurer, you look at Marmoset, you look at Frank Carr and the Rattlesnake, especially their latest album. They're difficult to classify. You can't really pin one genre solely on them. You can say, oh, it's this, but with da 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 But you cannot... I, I feel like it'd be wrong to say Conjurer are a post-metal band as much as it's really weird to say they are a sludge metal band, as much as it'd be weird to say they are a death metal band. And like similar sort of thing goes for Mama Zets and Frank Carter. But my in the early 2000s, things were mildly different. You had bands like, we had like Let Live, who were very all over the place with terms of what they were bringing into post-hardcore. Um, Devin Townsend, as much as he was in that prog scope he was incorporating various different sounds but each album had the same core sound does that make sense at the time look at an album like transcendence and even empath not okay empath and what was the i can see the artwork in my head epic cloud there we go um even with like Epicloud Transcendence and Empath, you've got various different genres of various different, in, across various different songs in that album. But back in these days, Devin sort of stuck to one core sound for each album, but it was just a different core sound for each album, if that makes sense. Probably doesn't. And, you know, like back in back in the day, 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 day Ruben tried it as well, incorporating lots of various different things into their own version of post hardcore but it never really caught on like that it was something where it was a cool band to look at from afar when a band was being like so difficult to classify but people like liked labels more then than i think they do now they are i think people are a bit more open to having just music in front of them as opposed to it's got to be this and it's got to be that and like even i've calmed down with it a lot i'll he was a huge genre Nazi back in the day, but now it's just give me the music, just just layer it on me, just smother me in it. Got weird. Um, and yeah, in this like early two thousand period, Hawkeye's exploded with ideas, and um, as I also previously said, they were previously guised as Chicken Hawk, and as Chicken Hawk, they were a maddening blend of experimental. Uh, sludge, stoner rock, prog, even sometimes borderline mathcore. The self-titled and the Modern Bodies albums were both really strong. They got really strong underground fanfare and a lot of good reviews. It's when they had that name change and they became Hawkeyes. That's where calming down the sound, I feel, is... It takes more away from what they deserve. It's basically they just refashioned their output. It's still a mad hodgepodge of genres, but the songwriting was so vastly different and so much better than Modern Bodies and the self titled Chicken Hawk album, which allowed for that mainstream attention to go into Hawkeyes. And, you know, damn near every single major rock and metal genre is represented in some way in this album. And like I said, when it came out in 2012, as a self-confessed genre Nazi, it drove me bloody insane because I couldn't, like, put, trying to put it into my iTunes, I had no, I had to go through every single song and put, like, their own individual fucking style of music. It took me fucking ages. Thanks, lads. But it made like the whole experience made up was made up for by the fact that ideas is one of the best collections of music 
going you, you, ever released in my opinion it is a blindingly good record is ideas we will start with the quote-unquote real song of the album which is sky spinners um without the song and the accompanying music video making it to the likes of uh scars and i think it must have had some play on kerrang back in the day as well um without sky spinners it could have all been a much different story just another underground band that gee wouldn't it be wouldn't it have been good if they made it through or like the one for the hipsters was like oh yeah i used to love this band back in the day then they split up and blah 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 it is enough of an accessible and marketable song that would make it get on the telly and get on the radio and whatever but it was still enough to be a showcase of Hawkeye's personality and their how they how they did their music. The drum and bass rolls throughout the verses from Stephen Ryan. They're not like standardized four four, so it does add a little prog element and a little like offshoot sort of characteristic from their sound. Um, those odd guitar licks in between verses from Rob and the choruses that can really show off Paul's clean vocal ability you are immediately drawn in like it's an it's an ear-catching song sky spin is and it just acts as like an old ps1 demo for like the full album that would be ideas i think hollywood sweatshop can be seen as sky spinners demented twin brother it's got a similar like between section riff but there is like an eerie shoegazy opening verse like a really pounding chorus, um, sections of like punk rock confrontation. You've got like an anthemic rock side to it as well. A like in the latter part of the song, there is a revision of the shoegaze. Now we just that extra like oomph behind the sound. It is like there's just in that you've got about four different genres on display in one song. And they transition together so smoothly that you don't really, you know, you listen to one song somehow, but it doesn't really feel like for 30 second songs, it feels like one complete piece of music. Um, other highlights from the album include the very intimidating Yes, Have Some. It's got a shrieking, terrifying um looping riff with like a really really good um crunchy tone headstrong goes full into like the stonery sludge kind of side of hawkeyes um you deserve a medal and milk hog yeah i don't know why i said that so weird milk hog they they both sit as like the furthest the album ever goes into an extreme metal album or extreme metal sound you deserve a medal has this blistering pace with Paul just barking lyrics at you. Milk Hog is a nonsense song about milk with like the lyrics are just spat at you with such vile and such venom, all like over the top of these like overly fuzzed sludgy riffs. Because just what the fuck not? Honestly, it's an album and Hawkeye as a band, both are just they were about like the whole piece is so ahead of its time like hindsight's a beautiful thing and it would i honestly think if they were to break now they the attention that conjure have got recently would be the same sort of thing to what hawkeyes would be getting like hawkeyes got a lot of attention from like the underground music i remember steve hill out on the metal hammer podcast that would always go on about hawkeyes and that's where it all started for me, but nowadays, if they came out, everyone would be going fucking batshit over Hawkeyes. And, like, looking back, as much as they did get a lot of praise and a lot of attention in those days, I don't feel like it was enough. I feel like they deserved a lot more for ideas, and even on the follow up, um, everything is fine from 2015, which has got a much darker sound 
and it's a toss it depends on the day which one i prefer between ideas and everything is fine because they're both such great records it didn't really resonate with people not many people still now talk about hawkeyes or like worried about where the band were gonna go if they were gonna come back or whatever it is such a diverse all-encompassing metal record um the riffs are in abundance and they are as sharp as they are heavy songs are creative and catchy and there is a very very cynical part of me which comes as a surprise to hopefully no one that the reason why hawkeye's come in my head to do for open mic is i there's a there was a post last week or week before that said hawkeye's are making a comeback the new album comes out the 6th of september so i i'm i am very excited for that um then there's a new album there's a lead single out already called royal trouble which is very very good but i'm worried with the news of their impending comeback that it will go down a similar route to feed the rhino you know feed the rhino had a like hugely breaking album called silence and the sound which it was fucking brilliant and then after that they sort of went dark re-emerged a few a few years later as well back when like after all like the big um like the big furore about them had died down and then they came back with the silence. I think I got the album wrong a minute ago. It's called the Sauron Sound. They came back with the silence last year. Again, a great record. Not quite up to Sauron Sound levels, but still fantastic album. But then they broke up. Was it the start of this year? End of last year? Something like that. And I'd be absolutely gutted if it went the same way as Hawkeyes. Um, I think. Get them on tour with a band like Black Peaks. Because everyone's looking at Black Peaks at the moment. Um, and I think the sounds from those two bands, Hawkeyes and Black Peaks, I think would co complement each other quite well on the live circuit. Get Hawkeyes on, that, on a tour like that. And I think the buzz around them will skyrocket, skyrocket again. And we can have a happy few years or few more years with Hawkeyes still in our lives, still being very prevalent, still releasing lots of very, very, very good music. And that will keep me happy. And at the end of the day, that's what I care about. Um, if you are a fan of the St. Pierre Snake Invasion, which is a mad band I found whilst doing this review, Pulled Up by Horses or even Ruben, do go check out Ideas by Hawkeyes. It was their uh, third, second, and first album. It's up to other people to decide what it is, but here we are. Um, it came out in 2012. Honestly, it is just such a great album. If you like metal, if you just like any form of heavy metal, go and look for it because it will make you very happy inside the weird parts of your soul. And that will about do it for me this week. I actually have a sore throat because I haven't stopped talking for over an hour. You're welcome. Next week, what have I got next week? We should have reviews for in this well for Grindcore. We've got Full of Hell for Metalcore. We've got Upon a Burning Body, and for very floaty emo pop punk, we've got Fresh. One of these things, not quite like the other. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode or any other do feel free to get come and come and have a chat with me on the various social medias i might reply i don't know why i said that i would reply um but yeah come hang out come tell me i'm shit at music or shit at talking about music um but until otherwise i will hopefully see you next week i see no reason why we shouldn't don't know why i keep doubting it but yeah bye